Good morning, good morning, good morning. This morning's scripture reading is coming from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. This is going to be the NIV version. If you're using the Pewback Bible, it's going to be on 1896. This is 11 and 12. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. Keep your Bibles there. We're going to stay there uh, this morning for part of our introductory comments. Let me say again, as has been said, if you're visiting with us, we are delighted to have you uh, and hope that you will uh, come back and want to be a part of uh, future services here. Uh, and what a good congregation this is. I don't need to tell uh, many of you that. You already know that. Here in this verse, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11 and 12, when you read, when you pick up here, you're picking up in the middle uh, of a situation that I believe needs a little bit of introduction to understand where we're going to go with this today. And the question is asked here, what manner of persons ought you to be uh, in holy conduct? And when we think about that question, what manner of person ought you to be, uh, this is in light of what the writer here is talking about in the previous verses leading up to this. Now I want to read verse 9 and 10 to go along with it. Or begin with verse 8. It says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now let me talk about that verse for a moment. That does not mean that that's how God counts time. Uh, there are those who will say in the Bible that, especially with creation, that when God created something on the first day, that that wasn't literally one day, that that could have been a period of a thousand years, because this verse here says that one day is as a thousand years. That's just letting us know that God is not on the same time clock that we're on. God does not function like we function by a calendar and by a clock. We set an alarm clock to get us up in the morning and we know what time we're going to go to bed and that's just the way our life is designed and that's not the way that God is. God is not limited by time uh, and make sure that we understand that. But the point of that is what verse 9 talks about. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with a fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now that's the New King James Version. In light of the end of the world, in light of time as we know it coming to an end, here Peter is asking them the question, in light of that day approaching, what manner of person should you be? Now there may be a lot of things that are going through your mind, but Peter is going to answer this question for us in his writings here in 2 Peter. You know, Peter writes about a lot of things. And if you break the book down, as I think that you should when you study it, and, you, and you, you find every question that Peter is going to ask, he will in turn answer it if you'll go through and study and try to find those answers. But here, specifically, he says, in light of the day of judgment, in light of a day when you're going to stand before the Almighty God and you're going to give an account of your life and the things that you were about and the things that were most important to you, what manner of person should you be? Now you go ask that question to somebody in the world, they're going to look at you like you've got you know, four eyes across the top of your head because they don't think about things spiritually. But us as Christians, when we think about and we're reminded about that there is going to be a, a day when time as we know it comes to an end and there we'll face that great judgment day, 
what kind of person should we have been? You know, if you don't do that reflection now, if you don't do an inventory of your life now, if you don't do an assessment of your life now, I'm going to tell you this, when that day comes, it's going to be too late. You won't have an opportunity once that trumpet sounds. Once the call from God goes forth to where he sends, as the Bible says, angels to gather all nations before him, if you wait till then, you've waited too late. So we got to assess ourselves. This morning, I'm going to tell you right now, if you have got your roast in the oven and it's set to come out at 11.10 this morning, uh, you can leave now. Okay, I've just got a lot of points I want to make this morning, all right? And I'm going to go quick, but there are ten things that Peter answers in the book of 2 Peter that deal with the subject of what manner of person ought you to be when it comes to the judgment, okay? Now, are you ready? Because I'm going to kick high gear here because I'm still going to have you out in 20 minutes at 11 o'clock. And if I don't get finished, I'll finish it tonight. So then you've got to come back. Maybe I ought to do that anyway, okay? Part two tonight, okay? Here we go. Peter tells them several different answers to the question, what kind of person ought you to be? Number one, he tells them, be Christians. To those who are not, he is encouraging them to do what he said as he, as he preached on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. But he reminds those who are Christians a reminder to be what you have set out to be in your life. Be Christians. Now let's look at a couple of verses. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which or who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible undefiled and that does and that fades not away reserved in heaven for you now look at these things really quickly the highlighted points there those are the things that we we became part of when we became a Christian and there he's reminding us there don't forget who you are as a Christian. Folks, we live in a world today where I think we need to be reminded of that often. That if our focus isn't 100% where it needs to be, it is so easy to get drugged back into the world, isn't it? To let the world have an active part in our life. And he goes on to say in 1 Peter chapter 1, Verse 22 and verse 23. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. What did you do when you obeyed the gospel? You had your sins washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, didn't you? And there you were made white as snow. You were purified your soul before God. Through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible but by the word of God which lives and abides forever and it talks about the relationship that we share with each other within the church so Peter sets out by saying be Christians not in name only but also in deed in heart in spirituality in maturity as you grow as a Christian be Christians Now, make sense? You know, a lot of times people don't like to be told what to do. And here Peter is addressing it head on. And you're going to see a lot of things that he's going to talk about as we move forward to this. And it's a great reminder to us that there's a responsibility that goes along with carrying this name Christian. And it's not just a responsibility to God. It's a responsibility to this church. And it's a responsibility to each other. And I think they're all important that make up who we are as a Christian. Second thing, or there's another verse if you want to write it down. 1 Peter chapter 4, 16, 17, and 18. Okay? Peter tells them what manner of person should you be. You need to be obedient children. Parents, how many of you like obedient children? I mean, really? 
You know, I liked it. To, I liked it when my kids were obedient. Okay? Now, remember this. When, when they weren't, what do you do? Well, you, you just ignore it. And someday they'll figure it out and they'll get better. We had a, a, a family at Flatwoods when I was the youth minister. And, uh, and again, everybody's different. But they had this one son that they just felt like that they were never going to discipline. They were never going to tell him no. Uh, when he was four years old, he went outside during worship service and walked around to the side of the church building, jumped up on the air conditioner, climbed up the gutter, and was up at the top of the roof when we got out of worship service. And they had to call the fire department to get him down. Uh, and I could remember somebody looking at his dad and saying, are you going to tell him no now? And they never did. And I won't tell you how that story ended because it's not very pretty. But here Peter is telling them and telling us, be obedient children. I love my kids, whether they were good or bad. Some were better than others. <laughs> but it's the same way with God. We are his children, are we not? And he's looking down on us and he's with us all the days of our life. And here we're being reminded by Peter that God is saying, be obedient children. Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning with verse 13. You know, wherefore gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust, lust in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so you be holy in all manner of conversation. Be obedient children to God, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy, and if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning, here in fear. Not fear necessarily of afraid, but fear out of respect of what God has done for you. So be obedient children. You don't want to worry about the judgment day. You don't want to have to worry when that time comes. Be obedient children, and you're not going to have to worry about it. To get to a point into your life to where you can get up every day, look in the mirror, and say, if today is the last day this earth goes on, that's fine with me because I've got something better waiting. Now, that's hard to do sometimes, but that's the reality of who we are as Christians. And I believe that you have reached a certain level of maturity in your life and in your relationship to God if every day that you get up, you can say, I'm thankful for another day, but if this is my last day here, it's okay because I've got a better place that's waiting for me. Isn't that the hope of all of us? Isn't that your joy that you have this morning? I hope it is. Because if you've got that hope in anything other than that, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be really disappointed. I've been working on a sermon for several months. I told you about this once before. But it's entitled, Judgment Day Surprises. And I think I'm going to preach that here in a couple of weeks if I can finish it up on the PowerPoint part of it. There are going to be a lot of people who are going to wake up on that day and they're going to be surprised. And the Bible talks about those people who are going to be surprised. I don't want you to be surprised. As Christians, I want you to look forward to that day. That you're ready when that day comes. And you, you maybe are not wishing it to happen right now, but if it does, it's okay. And here Peter is saying, be obedient children. Number three, th that we're to be growing children. You know, I've been giving Adam a hard time for... The last couple of years, Adam was afraid he's never going to be taller than Dave. And, and he wanted to be tall. And I said, you know, it's all right. You're going to grow. And if you've noticed, Adam has really started to grow. Uh, I don't think he's going to be 6'8", uh, but I think he's going to be taller than Dad. He is taller than Dad. See? He made it. 
We're not talking about a physical growth. We're talking about spiritual. If you are the same spiritually as you were five years ago, something's wrong. If you're the same spiritually today as you were 10 years ago, something's wrong. If you've just been a Christian for a year and you're the same spiritually as you were a year ago, something's wrong. Because the Bible has told us, and Peter is going to remind us, that as Christians we are to grow spiritually. And the way we do that is spending time in God's Word, being actively involved in the church, and being involved with Christian people in our life. Then you'll grow spiritually. You cannot remain the same and be pleasing in the eyes of God. We've got to grow and grow and grow to where we understand more of what it means to be Christ-like. And that's what a Christian is supposed to be, Christ-like in every endeavor of our life. To where we get to the point of that corny little saying that says, what would Jesus do? I remember when those bracelets came out, everybody wanted to wear those, and everybody bought one of those. You know, everybody wore WWJD, okay? No, it's not what would JD do, but I think it would fit. What would Jesus do? That's a, re that's a real question. That as you mature and grow as a Christian spiritually, that you will indeed ask yourself that when you're making decisions in each aspect of your life. How do I handle this? You know, I watched a thing... I think it was Friday evening or Thursday evening, and, uh, you know, it was about, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it was about individuals who were living in sin. And they were being condemned, or necessarily the law was being changed to where it was going to be illegal for them to continue to do what they're doing. And, and the individual who was being you know, condemned, he said to them, and it's their same argument that they all use, they would say, well, what would Jesus do? What do you think Jesus would say to us? And somebody in the background, before they had a chance to bleep it out, said, he would say, go and sin no more. It's exactly what he would say. And that's what Jesus tells us in our life, that as we grow, we know we're going to fall short. We know we're going to do things that are wrong. We're going to slip up along the way. Jesus would say, you know, if you ask for forgiveness, you're forgiven. Now go and sin no more. That's what Christian growth is all about. Look what Peter says. Wherefore, lay aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisy and envies and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And everybody reads that and says, oh, that's talking about the new Christian. The new Christian starts out on milk. And then as they grow, they're able to digest some of the weightier matters that are there in Scripture. And folks, I believe this verse was written to all Christians is that we, through study, may grow thereby. Now, does a newer Christian need to really be diligent to spend time in the Word of God so that they can be able to handle the things that are going to come their way? Yes, without question. But don't we as older Christians need to be reminded of the first principles of Christianity every once in a while? You know, a baby doesn't come out of the womb and start running. They first have to learn to crawl, and then they learn to pull themselves up, and they'll stumble around, and they'll have bruises, and they'll have black eyes, and then they begin to walk. And then before you know it, they've moved on to the point, and you look down around here, and you see all these babies that are running around here so fast that you can't catch them. In the life of a Christian, it's going to be that way. You're going to start out crawling a little bit. But the more you study and the more you progress in your understanding of spiritual matters, then we grow thereby. And we become what God wants us 
to be. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. How do you grow in knowledge? How do you grow in grace? Well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There's the simple solution. You're not going to grow your faith you're not going to grow spiritually if the only thing you feed yourself is what you get fed on Sunday morning. I hope you get fed well. I hope when you leave here on Sunday afternoons when we're done, I hope you go out of here and spiritually you feel like you're full. That's my prayer every time we come to worship God. And I'm not talking about just my part. I'm talking about our singing and the prayers and our, our, our partaking of the Lord's Supper, every aspect of who we are as a church. I hope when you leave, you leave here and you're full spiritually. Because you know why? If you're full spiritually, you're ready to take on whatever's out there. You're ready to take on whatever you face out there in the world. But you've got to grow away from here. you got to keep feeling it. You know, I'm having a hard time adjusting my lifestyle to where now, every time I think about food, I don't eat. Okay? I no longer eat for enjoyment. I just eat to stay alive. And that's a harsh reality. You, you know, when God created man, he provided them food to keep them alive, not for enjoyment. Okay? Now, there are some things that we can enjoy. Spiritually, you got to continue to feed yourself. That's why we encourage you to read the Bible through in a year. Because that meant daily you were making a, a commitment to spend time in God's Word every day. And I promise you this, this book is so great and so wonderful that every time you read it, you will glean something new every time. How many of you read Tom Sawyer when you were a kid? Pretty good book, wasn't it? But you could only read it so many times. This book gives me something every time I'm in it. There are verses that I have read hundreds and hundreds of times. And they go back and one day, particular day, I read them and it's like... Where's that been? Who put that in there? It was there all along. But just whatever, where, you are, where you're at in your faith at that particular time will bring forth another meaning. That's why God said this book is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive. It's basically alive to us spiritually. And here Peter is saying, grow as children of God. Tells them to be praiseworthy people. To be praiseworthy people. Look what he says here. But you are a chosen generation. Now there's a sermon right there. I could spend the next 20 minutes talking about just that first part of that sentence. You are a chosen generation. Let me tell you this. You remember growing up as a kid and they would divide up and pick teams? You remember that? You know, when I was in fifth grade, I was the most uncoordinated thing ever was, and nobody wanted me. Nobody. So as they're dividing up and they're picking teams, I was always last. All right, we'll, we'll take him. You know, I got my revenge later on. It felt horrible. I felt absolutely horrible that nobody would ever pick me first. I just one time wanted to be picked first. And I remember one day the teacher came out and she always saw that I was last. So she said, today we're going to choose teams and here are the captains. And she said, Todd, you're one of them. And you could hear the moans. Oh. <laughs> and I walked up there, shoulders back, and I thought, it's good to be wanted. She picked me. 
And here this verse is saying, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Who is that? That's you. And guess who picked you? God picked you. Isn't that wonderful? No matter what you're going through in your life today, whatever trial or whatever tribulation, and you think nobody cares, stop. Because God cares. He loved you so much that he picked you. And I'm so thankful that he did. He goes on to say that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and as pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation." You know what that means? You know what that says? By you, how you live your life, nobody can speak evil against you. Man, that's tough. Paul, writing to Timothy and, and Titus, told them that by your sound words and by your life and by your actions, nobody will be able to speak evil of you. You think about that for a moment. Who am I away from here? Am I the kind of person that when people see how I respond to a certain situation, will they consider you to be praiseworthy in the eyes of God because you conduct yourself as a Christian should and not as the rest of the world does? And yes, I'm going to condemn myself here for a moment. You're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. How do you respond to that? You race after them. You chase them down. You pull them over and you get out and you just thump the life out of them. happened yesterday. I saw the news report. You may all see that. Happened. I don't see that person as being a Christian, do you? And it goes beyond that, and it goes things before that. But do things that are, things that are praiseworthy in your life. He tells us to be good citizens. Now, that's important right now. Okay? It's an election year. And here Peter is telling them and telling us today to be good citizens. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 through 16. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of who? Of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, or as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of the foolish men as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Now, in short, what's he saying here? Obey the laws. Obey the laws. And... We can go to other verses, but time's not going to allow. There are other verses that tell us that when we as Christians think about the leaders of our nation, what should we do? Pray for them. We don't have to agree with them. We certainly don't have to <clears throat> support them by giving them our vote. But when whoever it is, whatever it is, is elected to that office, we as Christians have the responsibility in our prayers to pray for them. And I think you can all see the necessity of that. Are those wasted words? Nothing's wasted in the presence of God. Understand what the first part of this says. Sometimes those people are put in a position so that they will bring us back to our place. Some are brought into power to do evil. You know, you look at the Old Testament, how did he work there? He might not directly punish them where as many cases as he did. Sometimes he wiped out 20,000 at a time, 24,000 at a time. But he also says, I'll rise up nations against you to humble you 
And there they'll go through a period of years of where they're in persecution and then they finally realize we don't want to be like this. And then what do they do? They shout to God. God be with us. I almost feel like that's the way we are today. That we as Christian people, a Christian world, ought to, we, we're shouting to God, God help us. And maybe that time is not over yet for us to do that. But be good citizens. The next one, be informed people. Be informed. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks for reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. Be informed people. Informed about what? The church. Somebody would ask you today as you're walking out, a visitor here maybe, would ask you as you're walking out, uh, I notice you don't have instrument of music. How many of you can answer why we don't use it? Okay? Be informed people. It's not a matter of opinion that we don't have instrument of music. Okay? It's not up for debate. Could you answer why we don't? Someone would ask you, oh, you're a Christian. How did you become a Christian? How many of you could answer that? Okay? And I mean more than just here's my opinion of what I've done and show them in the Bible. Be informed people. Why do we have elders in the church? Why do you call them elders? How many of you can answer that? Be informed people. And it's the idea, be ready always to give an answer to anyone that asks of you the reason of the hope. How many of you can answer that? Where does your hope come from? Well, my hope comes through Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Where's your hope? My hope's in heaven, and I'm going to get there because I've done this, and, and I've been obedient to what the Bible has to say. And, and, and to, be, to be into that category, to be able to answer that. So be informed. How do you become informed? You study. You know the material. You know what the book says. And you put that into your life. Be humble, people. I'm trying to hurry. I've got two more. And I'm about out of breath. Be humble, people. Humility. You all have heard the song. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in so many ways. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking every day. And the song goes on and it, it, it's, we laugh at that. But how many of you really know somebody that's like that? To where humility is not one of their strong traits. To where when you talk to them, it's hard to carry on a conversation because no matter what you've done, they've done, and they've done it better than everybody else. Anybody know anybody like that? Yeah, we all do. You know, not everybody knows everything, and not everybody's done everything. But there are people who have no humility. And here, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder." Yes, of all of you, be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. If you're proud, beware. Because God resists the proud and He gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. What a verse. What a verse. Be diligent. I've got more than two. Sorry, I've just now started the second page. Be diligent. Be a remembering people. Remember where you've come from. Remember what you've gone through. It says, wherefore, I, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in present truth. Yes, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Remembering what? Knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in your remembrance to remind us of the kind of people that we're supposed to be last two be holy 
You say, well, everything you've talked about right now fits into that category. Well, it's probably an aspect of it. But I think when you come to the part of the Bible where the Bible says be holy, there is a grave thought that goes with it. Okay? And here we find it. It says, Wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation as Jesus Christ. We've read this part. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as which hath called you, who hath called you is holy. Okay? You be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, and look what the last part says. Why? For I am holy. Now, was Peter holy? Yeah. But Peter was holy because God was holy. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. God calls us to be holy. Holy, acceptable in the sight of God. Folks, if you are an unholy person Monday through Saturday, you're not holy just by walking through the doors and coming in here to worship. Being a Christian is not just a thought, it's a lifestyle. I'm trying to get better and I'm changing my lifestyle. It makes a big difference. When something becomes part of who you are on a daily basis, you will eventually mold and shape yourself into that which you're desiring to become. Be holy, for I am holy. God is holy. And that's what we're called to be. Last one, I promise. Be watchful people. Be watchful. Peter goes on to say, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we look according to His promise. Look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things... Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Be watchful. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. The end of all things is at hand, but you, therefore, be sober and watch. Under prayer. What are you watching for? What are we watching for today? We're watching for the sun to come out. I miss the sun. But as a Christian, guess what I'm watching for? I'm watching for the sun. Because the Bible says, Behold, we shall all. Meet him in the air. Be ye therefore watchful. Are you watchful today? We're going to sing the invitation song that Brother Dave's picked out for us, and we sing to encourage. We really do. You know, this is about being part of God's family, and, uh, you know, it's about having the relationship that says, I can open myself up. And I can let my family know that, when I, that I'm struggling. And I used to say this statement a lot, and I've stopped saying it, but I think I'm going to start saying it a more, some more. Is when it comes time for the invitation, you need to be rest assured that we're not here to judge you. We're here to love you. And I think we all, at some point in our life, need to examine ourselves to make sure that that's our attitude anytime anybody responds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we're not judgmental, but that we're loving and kind and accepting. And we'll leave the judgment part to God on that great day. This morning, if you need the prayers of the church, we're here to pray for you. If you need to be baptized, we're here to take your confession and baptize you for the remission of your sins.
there real quickly there's everything that we talked about though you probably don't remember them already uh, but think about the things that the kind of person that you ought to be as we stand and as we sing